Hello everyone, Corey here. Today I'm going to read over with you Chapter 5 from Mental Chemistry by Charles F. Hanel. This chapter is called Vibrations. Let me find the page really quick. I had it and then it kind of just closed. Okay, so before we get started, I'm listening to my study audio. This one is Binaural Beats. It's called Higher Thought Advanced Awareness. And the following frequencies are used. 141.27 Mercury. It's for intellectuality, mobility, frequency associates with orbit of Mercury, effects, support, speech, center, and communicative intellectual principle, associated with communication and cleverness, and also 153.58 Hz, which is Jupiter, growth, success, justice, and spirituality, frequencies associated with the orbit of Jupiter, the effect, supports creative power and continuous construction, generosity, continuity, magnanimity, and joviality. Binaural beat frequency 42.31 hertz, 42 hertz and above associated with higher thought, perception, and reasoning. So, let's get started. Chapter 5, <clears throat> Vibration. Before any environment, harmonious or otherwise, can be created, action of some kind is necessary. And before any action is possible, there must be thought of some kind, either conscious or unconscious. And as thought is a product of mind, it becomes evident that mind is the creative center from which all activities proceed. It is not expected that any of the inherited laws which govern the modern business world, as it is at present constit constituted, can be suspended or repealed by any force on the same plane. But it is axiomatic that a higher law may overcome a lower one. Tree life causes the sap to ascend, not by repealing the law of gravity, but by surmounting it. The naturalist who spends much of his time in observing physical, visible phenomena is constantly creating power in that portion of his brain set apart for observation. The result is that he becomes very much more expert and skillful in knowing what he sees and grasping an infinite number of details at a glance. Then does his unobserving friend. He has reached this facility by exercises of his brain. He deliberately chose to enlarge his brain power in the line of observation, so he deliberately exercised that special faculty, over and over, with increasing attention and concentration. Now we have the result, a man learned in the lore of observation far above his fellow, or on the other hand, one can be, be stolid in action, allow the delicate brain matter to harden and ossify until his whole life is barren and fruitless. Every thought tends to become a material thing. Our desires are seed thoughts that have a tendency to sprout and grow and blossom and bear fruit. We are sowing these seeds every day. What shall the harvest be? Each of us today is the result of his past thinking. Later we shall be the result of what we are thinking. We create our own character, personality, and environment by the thoughts which we originate or entertain. Thought seeks its own. The law of mental attraction is an exact parallel to the law of atomic affinity. Mental currents are as real as electric, magnetic, or heat currents. We attract the currents with which we are in harmony. Lines of least resistance are formed by a constant action of the mind. The activity of the brain reacts upon the particular faculty of the brain employed. The latent power of the mind is developed by constant exercise. Each form of its activity becomes more and more perfect by practice. Exercises for the development of the mind present, present a variety of motives for consideration. They involve the development of the perception faculties, the cultivation of the emotions, the quickening of the imagination, the symmetrical unfoldment of the intuitive faculty, which, without being able to give a reason, frequently impels or prohibits choice. And finally, the power of mind may be cultivated by the development of the moral character. The greatest man, said Seneca, is he who chooses right with the invincible determination. The greatest power of mind, then, depends upon its exercise in moral channels, and therefore requires that every conscious mental effort should involve a moral end. A developed moral consciousness modifies consideration of motives, 
and increases the force and continuity of action. Consequently, the well-developed symmetrical character necessitates good physical, mental, and moral health, and, it, and this combination creates initiative, power, resistless force, and necessarily success. We will, it will be found that nature is constantly seeking to express harmony in all things, is forever trying to bring about a harmonious adjustment. For every discord, every wound, every difficulty, therefore when thought is harmonious, nature begins to create the material conditions, the possession of which, we are, which are necessary in order to make up a harmonious environment. <coughs> when we understand that mind is the great creative power, what does, this be, what does not become possible? With desire is the great creative energy, we cannot see why desire... Can we not see why desire should be cultivated, controlled, and directed in our lives and destinies? Men and women of strong mentality who dominate those around them, and often those far removed from them, really emanate currents charged with power which, coming in contact with the minds of others, cause the desires of the latter to be in accord with the mind of the strong individuality. Great masters of men possess this power to a marked degree. Their influence is felt far and near, and they secure compliance with their wishes by making others want to act in accord with them. In this way, men of strong desire and imagination may and do exert powerful influence over the minds of others, leading the latter in the way desired. No man is ever created without the inherent power in himself to help himself. The personality that understands its own intellectual and moral power of conquest will assert itself. It is this truth which is, which an infamined world craves today. The possibility of asserting and slumbering intellectual courage that clearly discerns and a moral courage that, that grandly undertakes in open to all. There is a divine potency in every human being. We speak of the sun as rising and setting, though we know that it is simply an appearance in motion. To our senses the earth is apparently standing still and yet we know that it is revolving rapidly. We speak of a bell as a sounding body, yet we know that all the bell can do is to produce vibrations in the air. When these vibrations come at the rate of 16 a second, they cause a the sound to be heard in the mind. It is possible for the mind to hear vibrations up to the rate of 38,000 a second. When the number increases beyond this, all is silence again, so that we know that the sound is not in the bell, it is in our mind. We speak and even think of the sun as giving light, yet we know that it is simply giving forth energy, which produces vibrations in the ether at the rate of 400 trillion a second, causing what are termed light waves, so that we know that what we call light is simply a mode of motion, and the only light existent is a sensation caused, by, sensation caused in the mind by the motion of these waves. When the number of vibrations increases, the light changes in color. Each change in color brings being caused by shorter and more rapid vibrations. So that although we speak of the roses being red, the grass is being green, or the sky is being blue, we know that these colors exist only in our minds. That we are, and we are, sensa we are the sensations experienced by us as the result of the vibrations of light. When the vibrations are reduced below 400 trillion a second, they no longer affect us as light, but we experience a sensation of heat. So when we come to know that appearances exist for us only in our consciousness, every, even time and space become annihilated, time being but the experience of succession, there being no past or future except as a thought relation to the present. In the last analysis, therefore, we know that one principle governs and controls all existence. Every atom is forever conserved. Con whatever it is parted with must inevitably be received somewhere. It cannot perish and it exists only for use. It can go only where it is attracted and therefore required. We can receive only what we give and we may, only, we may give only to those who can receive and it remains with us to determine our rate of growth and the degree of harmony that we shall express. The laws under which we live are designed solely for our advantage. These laws are immutable, and we cannot escape from their operation. All the great eternal forces act in solemn silence. 
but it is within our power to place ourselves in harmony with them and thus express a life of comparative peace and happiness. Difficulties, inharmonies, obstacles indicate that we are either refusing to give what we no longer need or refusing to accept what we require. Growth is attained through the exchange of the old for the new, of the good for the better. It is a conditional or reciprocal action. For each of us it is a complete thought entity, and the completeness makes it possible for us to receive only as we give. We cannot obtain what we lack if we tenaciously cling to what we have. The principle of attraction operates to bring to us only what may be to our advantage. We are able to consciously control our conditions as we come to sense the purpose of what we attract and are able to attract from each experience only what we require for our future growth. Our ability to do this determines the degree of harmony and happiness we attain. The ability to appropriate what we require for our growth continually increases as we reach higher planes and broader visions, and the greater our ability to know what we require, the more certain we shall be to discern its presence, to attract it and to absorb it. Nothing may reach us except what is necessary for our growth. All conditions and experiences that come to us do so for our benefit. Difficulties and obstacles will continue to come until we absorb their wisdom and gather from them the essentials of further growth. That we reap what we sow is mathematically exact. We gain permanent strength exactly to the extent of the effort required to overcome our difficulties. The inexorable ex requirements of growth demand that we exert the greatest degree of attraction for what is perfectly in accord with us. Our highest happiness will be best attained through our understanding of the conscious cooperation with natural laws. Our mind forces are often bound by the paralyzing suggestions that come up to us, the crude think that come to us from the crude thinking of the race, and which are accepted and acted upon without question. Impressions of fear, of worry, of disability, and of inferiority are given to us daily. These are sufficient reasons in themselves why men achieve so little, why the lives of multitudes are so barren of results, while all the time there are possibilities within them which need only the liberating touch of appreciation and wholesome ambition to expand into real greatness. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to grow. We're here to learn all this stuff. I believe in this information and the importance of it, and I believe that it is something that we all should know, which is why I'm sitting here reading it to you now. Stick with me. Read with me. Learn with me. Because we are learning what no one is learning. We are reading what no one is reading, because we are becoming who no one is being. Let's be that person no one is being. Me and you. Women, perhaps even more than men, have been subject to these conditions. This is, tr this is true because of their finer susceptibilities, making them more open to thought vibrations from other minds. And because this flood of negative and rep repressive thoughts have been aimed for especially at them. But it is being overcome. Florence Nightingale overcame it when she rose in the crimi to heights of tender sympathy and, ex and executive ability previously unknown among women. Clara Barton, the head of the Red Cross, overcame it when she wrought a similar work in the armies of the Union. Jenny Lynn overcame it when she shewed her ability to command enormous financial rewards, while at the same time gratifying the passionate desire of her nature and reaching the front rank of her day in musical art. And there is a long list of women singers, philanthropists, writers, and actresses who have proved themselves capable of reaching the greatest liberty, dramatic, artistic, and sociological achievements. Women as well as men are beginning to do their own thinking. We have awakened to some conception of their possibilities. They have awakened to some conception of their possibilities. They demand that if life holds any secrets, these shall be disclosed. At no previous time has the influence and potency of thought received such careful and discriminating investigation. While a few seers have grasped the fact that mind is the universal substance, the basis of all things, 
Never before has this vital truth penetrated the more general consciousness. Many minds are now striving to give this wonderful truth definite utterance. Modern science has taught us that light and sound are simply different sensations of most intensities of motion, and this has led to discoveries of forces within man that could not have been conceived of until this re revelation was made. A new century has dawned, and now, standing in its light, man sees something in the vastness of the meaning of life, something of its grandeur. Within that life is the germ of infinite potencies. One feels convinced that man's possibility of attainment cannot be measured, that boundary lines to his on onward march are unthinkable. Standing on this height, he finds that he can draw new power to himself from the infinite energy of which he is a part. So men seem to attract success, power, wealth, attainment, with very little conscious effort. Other conquers, others conquer with great difficulty. Still others fail altogether to reach their ambitions, desires, and ideals. Why is this so? Why should some men realize their ambitions easily, others with difficulty, and still others not at all? The cause cannot be physical, else the most perfect man physically would be the most successful. The difference, therefore, must be mental, must be in the mind. Hence, mind must be the creative force, must constitute the sole difference between men. It is mind, therefore, which overcomes environment and every other obstacle in the path of man. When the creative power of thought is fully understood, its effect will seem to be marvelous. But such results cannot be secured without proper application, diligence, and concentration. The laws governing in the mental and spiritual world are as fixed and infallible as in the material world. To secure the desired results, then, it is necessary to know the law and to comply with it. A proper compliance with the law will be found in pro to produce the desired results with invariable exactitude. Scientists tell us that we live in the universal ether which we have thought or said, but it is pliable and forms about us, in, in us and around us, according